Our theme this month is heritage. And I think that all of our speakers here have given us quite a few excellent examinations of our heritage. But today I want to talk about a different kind of heritage. I am going to present to you a cultural heritage, an idea that has been passed down in our culture for a very long time. This will also be the second sermon on a series of ideas I put forth in my book, The Emergence of God. The particular idea I want to talk about is a falsehood that has been perpetuated for thousands of years and that has shaped the history of humanity. I call it the myth of centrality. The myth of centrality is the idea that humanity is the center of the world. The fancy term for this is anthropic arrogance. <clears throat> this is a condition that has been tamed mostly, though not exclusively, through our Western culture. <clears throat> In fairness, the concept arises because of how we experience the world. We all see the world primarily from the vantage point of our own bodies. From our viewpoint, everything revolves around us. Our senses alert us to things happening in front of us or behind us, or beside us. It takes a great deal of effort to see within or beyond ourselves. Ancient people observed the stars, the sun, and the moon circling around them. They saw the land extend outward in a flat plain in all directions, from themselves. The seas created artificial boundaries that surrounded their land. Consider the following. The word China means the middle country. If you translate the name of the Mediterranean Sea, you literally get Middle Earth. <coughs> The Sioux had long considered the Black Hills of South Dakota to be the center of the world. In J.R.R. Tolkien's stories, Middle Earth is the land of the humans. Mountains have often been seen as a connection between Earth and Heaven in the center of the world. There are several such sacred mountains in the world. They are the Axis Mundi, the world pillar or the cosmic center. They include Mount Kailash in India, the Kunlun Mountains in China, Mount Fiji in D Japan, Mount Uluru in Australia, Mount Olympus in Greece, or the mystical Mount Meru in Asia. Humanity has also constructed their own world pillars, such as the Egyptian pyramids or the ziggurats in Mesopotamia. Some trees have been given the same honor, including the mystical Celtic tree named Yggdrasil, the banyan tree sacred to the Hindus the bow tree of India, where the Buddha gained his enlightenment, or the tree of knowledge so central to the story in the book of Genesis. Which brings us around to the fact that the dominant religious traditions of Western culture have perpetuated this idea of human centrality. From the biblical book of Ezekiel, we read, quote, Thus says the Lord God, 
This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of nations with all countries around her." Unquote. Cities like Jerusalem, Rome, and Mecca were named the center of the world. When planets in our solar system were discovered, we assumed that our little planet was the focal center of all of them, including the sun. In scientific terms, this is known as the geocentric model of cosmology. This theory was prevalent well until the 16th century when Copernicus claimed that the sun was in fact the planetary center. This idea was so heretical that Copernicus waited to publish his findings until just before he died. This heliotropic model was condemned by the Christian church as a heretical concept. When Galileo confirmed the findings of Copernicus, he was condemned by the Inquisition for heresy was forced to recant and was confined to his home for the rest of his life. When this dangerous idea was finally more broadly accepted, we learned that ours was not the only solar system. And it was Edwin Hubble who discovered that ours was not the only galaxy either. But this led us to the galactocentric model of the universe because, of course, we had to be the center of all the cosmos. This assumption was made because it appeared that all the other galaxies were moving away from us. However, even this model has been proven to be incorrect. The easiest way to understand this is through the use of a complex scientific instrument called the balloon. The surface of a balloon experiences expansion in all directions. There is no center. No matter where you look on this balloon, it appears as if as you blow it up, everything is moving away from you. This long-standing heritage of centrality has had some debilitating consequences in our culture. For one thing, it can create a sense of us versus them, or good versus bad. If we believe that our little center of the world is the center, then we can consider those other people outside of this sacred invisible circle we have created. Those inside the circle are the good people, and those outside are the bad people. In versus out, good versus evil, the right people versus the wrong people, it's all the same thing. In the central circle, power structures emerge to maintain the boundary of the one true people. Even more focus is concentrated on the center of the center who is the leader. This attention can lead to extreme acts of control and narcissism, something we have all seen recently in our own government. The problem becomes worse when there are several circles of people, each of whom believe they are the center, the people of the truth, the righteous, among the heathens. On a more 
personal level, we have been led to believe that we are each the center of our own universe. The world revolves around what we do, what we say, and how we look. We must each look our best, do our best, be the best in whatever we do. Consequently, we have become a people of disillusionment and disappointment. We constantly try to live up to a model worthy of focus and scrutiny. We are the focus of our own attention, but are never quite good enough to merit that attention. We separate ourselves. We look for distractions. Recently, around 60% of all Americans have reported feeling lonely. We seek to fill the void <clears throat> caused by this separation by doing more, by buying more, by saying more but it never ends the feelings of inadequacy. In fact, our consumerist economy is dependent on just the sense of insufficiency. The real problem, though, is that when we are the center of the world, we leave no room for anything else. We separate the divine from ourselves. We devalue our relationships both to the sacred and to each other. We separate ourselves from the beauty and the contributions and the significance of the amazingly diverse world we live in. We even separate ourselves from the world itself. We have long believed that this planet is ours to do with whatever we want. We have only recently begun to see the disastrous result of this vain presumption. It has been said that the role of a minister is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So I am here to give you the bad news. Neither you nor I are the center of the universe. We are not the center of the galaxy. We are not the center of the solar system. We are not the center of the world. And we are not even the center of our own world. That's because just as with the surface of the balloon, there is no center. Now, I realize that this may sound disturbing, but I'm here to tell you that it is not. We may not be the most important thing in the universe, but there is a certain joy to insignificance. For one thing, we can begin to find out what is really significant in life. We can release the need to judge ourselves and others. We can gain a wider perspective on ourselves and our world. <clears throat> without this judgment, without this need to constantly improve or impress or improvise, without this pressure to be more than we are, we can be free to be our authentic selves. <clears throat> we can embrace all the blemishes and flaws and imperfections that make us the unique and distinctive person that we all are. Perhaps more importantly than any of these things, the real joy of insignificance <clears throat> is the chance to reach out to others and make the connections that are so important to the joy and happiness of being human. We can be there for others because we understand that each person 
is equally insignificant. <coughs> we can both offer assistance and ask for help when needed because there is no longer a separation between those who deserve to be in and those who are not. Now, I'm going to do something that ministers are not supposed to do. I'm going to tell you that everything I just said was false. That's right, false. It was all wrong, bogus, baloney. It was all a lie, a polemic ruse. <clears throat> but I am obliged to tell you the real truth, and this is it. You are the center of the universe. That's right. You are the absolute center of everything. But so is the person next to you, and the person in front of you, and behind you, as is every person in Barrie, or Berlin, or Bombay, or Beirut. Even now, there are wars raging in the Middle East, and Ukraine and Africa over land and religion and power because each side feels they have a certain right over others. <clears throat> the truth is that the center is everywhere, at every point and in every place and person. That means you are significant, special, and exceptional just like everyone else, no more than another. All these centers are interconnected like leaves on a tree or waves in an ocean. <clears throat> Each one is no less important. Each one is deserving of love and care and respect. Each one is beautiful in its own particular glory and splendor. But I cannot express the idea any better than can the Sufi poet Rumi, who said, and I quote, stop acting so small. You are the universe in ecstatic motion. Raise your words, not your voice. It is rain and not thunder that grows flowers. The very center of your heart is where life begins, the most beautiful place on earth. This is a subtle truth. Whatever you love, you are. In the name of that which you hold in your heart to be most sacred, may it be so. <clears throat> 